So I have been meditating for over a decade. I was 17 when I looked up some YouTube tutorials and started meditating a little bit. And then when I was 19, I had the pleasure and the privilege to attend a meditation retreat, a formal meditation retreat, which lasts for 10 days. All you do is meditate for 10 days, for 10 hours a day. And then with time, I've attended more of those, including one in China, where I lived with Zen monks for an entire month. In this video, I'm going to talk about the lessons I learned as someone who has been meditating for as long as I have. I've more or less maintained a daily practice. And so the, the lessons I've learned about my mind and the way my, my mind works and minds in general, I think works, I will put in this video. So the lessons that I've learned as someone who's been meditating for over a decade. If you're new to this channel, my name is Sankalp and I'm a DPhil student in psychology at the University of Oxford. And I also host the Understanding Emotions podcast, which is a podcast on emotional intelligence. If you would like me to make such high quality videos about meditation, emotional intelligence and more, a sub to this channel would be appreciated. Back to the video. All right, the first lesson I'm going to talk about is this. Your mind likes to go bananas. And by that, I mean it's all over the place. It's just distracted. And recall from the previous video, this is part two of a series of videos. I talked about how the purpose of meditation is to understand your mind and to understand your mind clearly, to develop that insight into how your mind works. So the very first lesson that any meditator learns is how nuts their minds goes. It's just all over the place. When you go into a retreat or just on the web, perhaps the instruction that you get is something along the the lines of pay attention to your breath or something like that. And sooner or later one realizes that that's much, much harder than what it sounds like. The moment you try to pay attention to the breath is the moment after or the two moments after your mind has gone somewhere on a trip of its own. It's thinking of the food you're going to have later. It's thinking of all the things that had gone wrong this day, planning for the future. It's thinking about that deadline coming in. And look, you're supposed to pay attention to the breath. And so the serious insight here is if I cannot pay attention to my breath, even for a few moments, if I can not understand the complexity of my breath just for a few moments, how can I hope to understand the complexities of the world? If my mind cannot even stay put for even a few moments, how? How can I hope that I will understand the economic system or the political problems that we have or the deep neuroscience and the psychology which tend to be my areas of interest? How can we hope to understand anything about the mind, the brain or anything at all really which has any degree of complexity? if we cannot even pay attention to our breaths for a few moments. And so that is my first lesson, which is your mind likes to go bananas. It, it likes to go all over the place. And meditation makes you confront that reality head on. The second lesson I'm going to talk about is pain is not the same as suffering. Pain and suffering are two different things. Now, I remember having this sitting in one of the retreats I was doing and that particular retreat, the instruction was to pay attention to your body sensations. So I was looking at my body. I was observing my knee, which was hurting a lot from the long sittings of that whole day. And I remember having that moment of like, hey, look, I have this pain in my knee clearly, but I also have suffering in my mind as a result of that Pain. So what that means is, hey, look, I was in pain, but then I was telling myself these stories about, oh, this, I wish this pain was not here. And oh, this is so painful. This is horrible. Oh, the teacher must have forgotten their time and so on and so forth. And it's just ridiculous. The stories that your mind spins. And at that moment, I realized that, look, there is pain there for sure. It's there and it's awful, but there is something in my mind which I can have some degree of control over. And that is what I'm calling suffering that those those interpretations those layers those beliefs that we have around raw experience are something that that are more in control than the objective pain itself and understanding that is was a game changer for me and that that I clearly saw I, I visibly noticed my body relaxed because I was no longer tense like that around that pain and I had more space for that pain to relax look could be a coincidence but the pain went away in a bit Look, I'm not by any means saying that pain is avoidable. In fact, that's going to be a lesson soon. But pain and suffering are two different things. And we observe the mind clearly is when you begin to get it. It's not just this theoretical concept. 
The next thing I'm going to talk about is pain is unavoidable. Now look, one of the core tenets of something like the theor theoretical foundations of Buddhism, for example, is life is suffering. And so you are going to have pain and suffering in life. And that's just part of the human experience. Now, a lot of people look at that fact, so to speak, and they're like, ah, oh, you're just being pessimistic. Life is more beautiful than that. And the Buddha was just a pessimist. The way I see it is, you need to understand and diagnose the problem clearly if you want to solve it. So for example, if you go to a dentist and if they identify that, hey, look, you have a wisdom tooth infection and that needs to be taken out or cleared out or whatever, you need to use a mouthwash or whatever those remedy is. But in order to go to the remedy, you need to have a clear diagnosis. And the way I look at the understanding of, look, pain is unavoidable is yes, it, it can be a bit of a downer for lack of a better word, but at the same time, it can be a lot of hope because at least you got your diagnosis clear. And it is one of those things that matures over time. When I first heard about it, I was just this pessimistic. And now I'm like, oh, that's just true. It doesn't mean life is going to be bad. In fact, it's going to be better because uh, I understand reality clearly. I understand the cards of life. I understand the rules of the game that we are in, which we call life. So pain is unavoidable. It's also one key lesson that I've learned over my decade of meditation. The next lesson I'm going to talk about is this. Suffering is the norm, not the exception. So a lot of times when people get to meditation, including myself, you have this belief that only you are the one who's doing poorly. So when you are trying to focus on your breath, your mind goes bananas, and then you go like, ah, I'm so bad, I'm such a bad meditator, I can't pay any attention, I must have some problems. And look, that is one experience that's shared with anyone who has meditated in history, especially in the beginning. And so the clear lesson here is suffering is the norm, not the exception. And of course, I'm using distraction as a toy example of suffering. And this is a very important lesson because this is the ultimate human connector. This is the ultimate thing that we shared amongst humans. In an age where we are more divisive, when we are trying to find differences, when we are tribal and when we are fighting against each other and so on, we need to find common grounds. We need to understand why we are similar and why we have this brotherhood or sisterhood and what's the basis for that. And I think suffering is the ultimate basis for that. Anyone suffers, in including animals. And uh, to know that the person who you met on the street, the friends that you have, the partners and the uh, colleagues that you have, have, there's one thing we all share in common and that is suffering. The technical term for this is common humanity and recognizing common humanity seems to be absolutely essential in unlocking self-compassion. It's one of the pillars of self-compassion and which, which in turn is a pillar of mental health. So if you would like to have solid mental health and thrive and be happy, then I think understanding common humanity is part of it. Now, of course, none of this means that uh, we should not be looking out for injustice and punishing people even when they do wrong. Of course we do. But at the same time, it's just true that everyone suffers. Uh, and in fact, that crime or that ill-doing comes from a place of suffering possibly, right? So suffering is something that is shared human experience and in fact shared living experience perhaps and it is something that you realize that you're not unique it's called the uniqueness fallacy by the way that you're not unique in this particular way in, in which you're suffering and there are people who share that with you and hopefully accessing that common humanity leads to a little bit of relaxation leads to a little bit of um, peace in your mind the next lesson i learned which i'm going to talk about is all feelings are impermanent or really all things that appear in the mind are impermanent. So we like to think that once we are in pain, we'll just constantly be in pain. Or when we have this particular suffering that we'll constantly be in suffering. So I, for one, have had the, well, let's just say misfortune of having some health crises in my life. And every time I've thought that it's just gonna be so bad and it's just gonna spiral down and I'm gonna just die. And that's, that's a very natural catastrophic thinking pattern that I've had and most people have. And something that has absolutely helped me in difficult and 
testing and trying times is to know that this too shall pass. So no matter what feeling you're feeling, no matter what sensations you're feeling, no matter what your state of mind is, one thing that you realize after meditating for as long as I have is none of it is permanent. None of it is just gonna last. And sometimes things last on the order of seconds. Sometimes they last for longer. But one thing that you know for sure is that they are gonna pass and things are impermanent. So I've had instances where I've had like anger and despair and it's lasted for days and observing that clearly looking at that sensation in my body not reacting to it being non-judgmental about it i see that eventually it passes now no one can put a timeline on it i think that would be you know controlling and that goes against letting go and accessing mental health and freedom that way but yeah everything is impermanent things are impermanent once you know this of course we understand this intellectually of course we see things grow and things die and things decompose and the same is true in our minds but somehow we like to think of ourselves as the static unchanging entities that are just gonna persist to eternity and when you see your feelings that closely when you're meditating, you begin to see that these feelings are impermanent and they, they pass. This too shall pass. And hopefully that is a mantra that we can live by and we can derive some solace in. Okay, so the next lesson I'm gonna talk about is our minds have this habit pattern of constantly trying to avoid pain and constantly moving towards pleasure. And the same axes, by the way, not two different things. So. We have this habit pattern, which seems very natural, seems very normal, that we have pain and we try to avoid it. And we have pleasure, we try to seek it. Now, what could be the problem with that, right? So, I'm so obvious. Well, the problem with that is that pain is unavoidable. We talked about it a bit earlier. And a lot of times what happens is when we have pain, we begin to suffer and we begin to think that this should not be happening. And that's a big problem because as we discussed, pain is unavoidable. So a lot of times what meditation has taught me is when I'm feeling pain, instead of just jumping to conclusions about why I am feeling it and how can I avoid it and how can I turn it off, which are all worthy questions, but instead of jumping to them directly, I found that I could create a little bit of space between that pain and my response to it. And I found I can find some calm in it. Another way of putting it is pain is not an emergency. Pain is not an emergency, or at least not always an emergency. And what that does is, uh, you can even see me now, I can, I can feel a little bit of a deeper breath that my system automatically took by just saying that. And so you can have that distance between your habitual response and the pain itself. And just knowing that if you are experiencing pain, you're not experiencing something that should not be there. And in fact, you're experiencing something that is part of the human experience. Now, of course, an incorrect way to take this insight would be that we just like suffer unnecessarily and we strive to not avoid pain. Of course, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is sometimes pain is unavoidable and pain cannot be easily turned off. And in those times, we could recognize pain as part of the human experience. And you could say to yourself, this is what it feels like to live. This is being human. And to me, that has really relaxed a lot and really uh, made me feel that I'm on the right path, even if I'm not feeling the best in that given moment. So it's been a big, big boost for me to go through massive health crises by just being like, okay, this is pain. This is part of life. Nothing unusual here. Of course, I'm going to try and avoid it. I'm going to try and mitigate it to the extent that I can, but to the extent that I cannot, I am human. Okay, so the next lesson I'm going to talk about is we are constantly telling stories to ourselves. So whenever anything happens, any sensation appears in your body, when you're meditating, you can clearly observe that. And then you can clearly observe the arising of the thought that follows that sensation. And more often than not, that thought is trying to interpret that sensation but ultimately, it's telling a story about what that sensation is all about, which can be true or not true. This is, by the way, where cognitive behavioral therapy or therapies of that sort step in and be like, hey, look, you have a sensation, but the beliefs that you're forming along those sensations may be true or not true. So we are constantly telling stories about what we are experiencing. Like what is true for me in this moment is that I'm talking to this camera, I can see myself, I can see this light, but the idea that I'm conveying a lesson to you all of these are stories what is happening is i'm speaking and there's words coming out of my mouth um, and so the objective or the story that i'm telling myself 
that, you know, these are the lessons that will benefit you and so on. Someone may actually disagree with it and that's okay. There can be competing stories and those stories could be more right and not right. Of course, I think these lessons are valuable, which is why I'm sharing, but it, it is totally possible that someone else has a different story around it. Now, the nature of these stories, the stories that we tell ourselves, is often egoic. I call them egoic fictions. It's often referencing us. So, you know, if someone said something bad to me and I feel negative emotions around it, I might tell myself the story of, okay, this person is just a bad person or this person might be having a bad day or this person didn't know what they were doing or this person comes from a different culture and their language is different. All of these are different stories that are possible for the same experiences. But notice that all of these stories were ultimately talking about how I am feeling. These are self-referential. And sometimes we may even have like identity statements around it, like, oh, so I'm, I'm just inferior to them or I'm just beneath them in some way or I'm not good enough. And so oftentimes these stories that we tell ourselves can be distorted, can be untrue. And carefully looking at those stories in a way that cognitive behavioral therapy does can be quite useful in helping our minds and helping us feel more alive and joyous in this world. So we are constantly telling stories to ourselves, whether it be about ourselves or whether it be about the larger world and often these stories serve us and recognizing that bias can be quite a game changer and it might help you understand reality much more better okay the next thing i'm going to talk about is this the cost of impatience often is insight what do I mean by that? So I think one thing I've been constantly highlighting is that the mind has the habit of jumping it just like sensation interpretation sensation interpretation and often the cost of that impatience jumping to certain conclusions or just assuming the first thing you think is the correct thing the cost of that often is insight there have been so many times where i've been absolutely certain that this is the wrong thing only to find out that it was not whenever i have managed to have patience and not jump to conclusions are the times where I have developed understanding because my mind is no longer consumed in this false interpretation of reality. And I'm not saying every time what we think is false. Of course not, especially if you've developed that view over time and with understanding. But if, if the reaction is habitual and if it's just like reactionary, then chances are high that it might be uh, just a knee-jerk reaction. And whenever I have avoid that, that temptation of making a conclusion and instead just focused on what's true. Where am I feeling those sensations in my body? What happens when someone says negative things about me? Oh, I feel my heart racing. I feel my palms are sweaty and so on. Is also when I see that, oh, okay, I don't need to actually buy into their reality. I don't need to subscribe to them. Whereas if I were to just be habitual and if I just to react to them, I might say something back to them, which might just spiral that situation out of control. And this is an example when someone was hostile, but equally true is an example when we are talking to our loved ones for with someone who we have decided to spend lives with or have deepest friendships with and when we have patience and we don't jump to conclusion we often develop insight we often develop insight into how our minds work and how others minds works and uh, this often creates this sense of safety and comfort and non-judgmentalness around us okay so the next one is the biggie it's the one that tips everything else and this is the insight that the sense of self is an illusion. Now, this, this often evokes like, what? I'm not real. And no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that people aren't real. I'm not saying I'm not real. Like what you're seeing is a real human. I can assure you AI. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The sense of self is an illusion. And what we mean by that when people say that, or what I mean by that is there is no one thing in the mind that stays constant that you can call you. This is another way to just say everything is impermanent in your mind. But this is more pointed because our suffering is threaded on the notion that we have this unchanging core within us. Like if I ask you to point towards me, chances are you're gonna point somewhere here. And if I point towards me, chances are I point here. But really it doesn't make sense. There's nothing behind my eyes. There's no part, one part of the brain, uh, which is you, where there's enough neuroscience to say that. And as Descartes famously said, there is nothing in the pituitary gland that is you either. That's not the seat of the self. And so the self is much more of a ephemeral concept. The way I like to talk about self is we are a collection of parts. We are not one unitary self. And that gives us much more flexibility 
in understanding who we are and understanding the times when we have conflicting motives. So there might be times when parts of us want to go out and make new friends and other parts of us want to stay in and cuddle and relax. And when we have this unitary notion of self, we might end up thinking that, hey, I'm just confused or I'm just a distracted person. And that just creates unnecessary self-hate. But when we have the sense that we are a collection of parts, then we can reconcile that reality much better that, hey, look, parts of me want to go out, wants to be more social, and then other parts of me want to stay in and just climb under the, uh, under the comfort of my blanket. When we have this clear understanding of these two parts, we can make these two parts talk. And a lot of parts-based therapy exactly does that. And so the sense of self is an illusion. And since most, if not all of suffering is tied to our understanding and our notion of what our self is, getting this insight and getting it truly, not just intellectually understanding it, is absolutely tantamount. When someone insults you, there's no you to be insulted. There's no one unitary thing to be insulted. A lot of times I've found that when people say bad things or bad comments or something, uh, just knowing that the sense of self is illusion, it just like sort of just like comes in and goes like that. It, it doesn't hit anywhere because there's no one place to hit. There's no seat of consciousness that where we are all located in. Now again, I don't mean there are no people there. Of course are people, but people are a collection of parts is what I mean. All right, and the final thing, the final lesson I'm gonna talk about is this. Meditation by itself is not enough. And I do want to conclude with that because a lot of people find meditation and until now I've been sort of addressing the skeptics, but a lot of people find meditation and they get completely consumed by it. And certainly I was that person in my first few years. Every conversation I had was about meditation. Every dinner table conversation or everything I talked to my friends was about meditation. I began telling people about meditation, telling people about all the insights I had. And to an extent that's normal, that's natural. When you find something that's as powerful, you, you get excited. But part of it was also subscribing to this notion of a magic pill. This one thing is gonna solve all my problems and it's gonna solve all of humanity's problems. If only people meditated more, we would have a better society. And I believe that to be not true now. I also don't believe that meditation is enough even for your own mind. Like I believe there's a place for psychotherapy. I believe there's a place for coaching. I believe there is a place for journaling and working on the level of beliefs. I made this video on the five levels of emotional intelligence. And I think thinking of any one level as the be all and end all is a mistake. So the politicians might think that, you know, it's just the social stuff. You change the social stuff, it's all sorted. No, there's internal beliefs. Like there has been decades worth of social progress and we cannot necessarily say that there has been decades worth of mental progress. And similarly goes for the meditators who think that all you need to go in the woods and meditate and that will solve all of society's problem. And I don't think that's true either. And you see that turning into cults where these fake gurus exploit people, promising them this magic solution. And I think at no point when we are meditating should we lose our independent critical thinking. It's absolutely important. Otherwise, there are a number of cults that we could end up being a part of. Whether we know of it as a cult, whether it is a former cult or not, it could just be a belief-based cult where it's just people are believing in certain things at face value without questioning it, without challenging their beliefs. And I think that was something that I'm going to leave you with, which is meditation by itself is not enough. It is not a magic solution. It is no panacea. There is room for healing trauma and shame and doing psychotherapy, which is, I think, the biggest other thing that one should do apart from meditation. And they work quite perfectly, in fact, with each other. So meditation by itself is not enough. All right, my friend, this was a long one. I'm exhausted. This is my fourth video for today. I hope you benefited. I hope you gained something from it. And uh, may you be happy. May you be peaceful and may you live with ease. Sankup signing off.